All right, I would like to welcome everyone to the University of Central Arkansas Society of Physics Students 2015-2016 seminar series. Uh, we're very lucky that the seminar series is supported by the Department of Physics and Astronomy and a grant from the University of Central Arkansas uh, Foundation, Alumni Foundation. If you're interested in the seminar series, you can contact me via Twitter at, at WSLATOA. Slayton or uh, via email at wbslaton at uca.edu. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, SPS chapter from Suffolk University in Boston. Very glad to have them joining us tonight, and hopefully we can have them join us again in the future. Our seminar speaker this evening is Dr. Greg Gabor. He is going to give us a presentation on the physics of invisibility. Uh, Dr. Gabor is an associate professor of physics and optical science at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. He received his BA with honors from the University of Chicago and his MA and PhD from the University of Rochester under the guidance. Uh oh. No guidance. An inverse source problem. <laughs> Since 2007, he has been writing about physics optics, and the history of science at his blog, Skulls in the Stars. And since 2012, has been writing the Science Chamber of Horrors on Tumblr. His blog writing has appeared in, quote, the Open Laboratory in 2010 and 2013, as well as the Best Science Writing Online in 2012. And from what I've seen on Twitter, we should be expecting a uh, American Journal of Physics article on cats in the near future. Is that right, Greg? Something along those lines, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So let's switch back over. We're going to let Greg take over. Greg, take it away with your seminar, please. All right. Hopefully you can see this. And uh, thank you all for joining me today. I'm going to talk about the history and science of invisibility, a little bit of a mixture of history and science. And really, sort of the overall theme of this talk, it's going to be a bit of a broad overview. And I like to start out by pointing out that invisibility used to be the stuff of science fiction and fantasy. It was something that people really didn't take seriously for a long time. But nowadays, invisibility cloaks seem to be kind of everywhere. Starting in around 2006 and onward, there's been a steady stream of articles talking about invisibility cloaks. and we seem to always be one step closer. Near the bottom, you can see there was even an article that just came out a few days ago about an ultra-thin invisibility cloak. And my favorite at the, bottom, at the bottom right for me is invisibility cloak makes tanks look like cows. Which will actually explain a little bit about what that means as we go on. But so there's been a lot of activity here, and it may not be clear to people on the outside how much of this we should really take seriously and what's really going on and what we're really going to do with this this science that we're learning. So I want to talk a bit about the history of scientific invisibility and how it compares to science fiction. There's a lot of interest and a lot of surprising connections there. And we'll also talk about how it works and then something that I'm very interested in is what else can we do with invisibility and cloaking in the lessons that we learn. And one of the big lessons that I hope to, to have people take away from this is that invisibility has uses beyond just hiding someone or something. There's more that we can do with this. So to begin though, we should point out that the word invisibility is pretty vague when you actually think about it. When you ask somebody, when you use the word invisibility and you're in a science fiction context, people, it's pretty obvious, but the term invisibility and even cloaks of invisibility has been around for a long time and meant a lot of different things. For instance, this article from 1944 during World War II talked about cloaks of invisibility, but they were pretty much literally talking about hiding in a hole, which we hopefully will be able to do a bit more sophisticated stuff than that. So one thing that we should keep in mind is that for a working definition, we should think of an object as invisible as if it would normally be observable or opaque under a specific set of circumstances but isn't, that it's sort of an exception to the usual laws of how we th see things. And there's a lot of interesting and strange phenomena that fit into that. 
For instance, even before the most recent cloaking craze started, there was this invisible cloak that appeared in 2003 done by researchers at Tokyo University. And I find these GIFs to be really quite creepy looking. I think they're also a little bit in slow motion, so that makes them just a bit creepier. And the person seems to be somewhat transparent, and this was billed as an invisible cloak back then. Though the technology behind it is a bit more mundane, simply put, what it is is the, the cloak is a retroreflective coat. It's a coat that's designed to pretty much send light back from the direction it came from. And then there's a camera behind the person that records the scene, and it sends that information to a projector in front that projects it on the person and they look see-through. Not really what people have in mind when they think about being invisible. However, this is something that does potentially have practical applications. The authors of this original research suggest that this could be used to make sort of a virtually invisible cockpit for a car or an airplane so that your vision wouldn't be limited by just the windshields. You could look around and see everything at all levels at all times. And it's research that I believe they're still working on. So keep that in mind. There's a lot of different things we can do with invisibility. But now I want to jump back to the earliest scientific explanation because the science of invisibility goes back a long time, to the 1850s at least. And there was a story written by Fitz James O'Brien back in 1859 called What Was It? And as far as I know, this is really the first scientific explanation of invisibility. Now, of course, there have been a lot of non-scientific magical stories about invisibility that go back much longer, but we'll restrict ourselves just to the examples where there was science involved. So I can't resist giving you a short summary of the story. So it's not really a spectacular story. There are two guys that they hear that there's a house that seems to be haunted, so they decide to spend the night in it. And they get attacked by an invisible monster. And they overpower it and tie it up. And it dies. So. Not a, not a really compelling bit of literature, but what's noteworthy, as I said, is that this is the first story where somebody tried to really explain how invisibility might work. And in this case, one of the characters tries to reason about how something could be invisible and still so fall under the venue of science and says, it's not theoretically impossible to make a glass so pure and homogeneous in its atoms that the rays from the sun shall pass through it as they do through the air, refracted but not reflected. And that was, of course, a long time ago. And it's natural to ask if O'Brien was actually correct. Well, we kind of know that he isn't. And it's pretty clear why. One thing is he mentions refraction. And refraction is the tendency of light when it goes from one medium to another to change its direction. And this example shows kind of the classic example of refraction in practice, that if you go spear fishing, you've got to aim closer than you think than the fish actually appears to be because the light coming from the fish bends, bends when it leaves the water. And this, of course, falls under what we nowadays refer to as Snell's law, which is the law that tells us how a ray of light bends when it goes from one medium to another. And Part of the key of this, and part of the important takeaway here, is that it really depends on the refractive index of light, which is the amount by which the speed of light is slowed in a medium. And in vacuum or in air, the refractive index is approximately 1. Light doesn't get slowed down at all. In diamond, the refractive index is 2.4, and that helps contribute to diamond sparkliness. But one of the reasons we can say that O'Brien isn't correct about invisibility is because, trans because whenever you have light at the interface between two media with different refractive indices, there's almost always a reflected wave. That there's some of the wave that gets transmitted, but there's some amount of light that gets reflected. And that means that we can usually see a transparent material. And this is why we typically don't walk into glass doors. Well. Most of the time, we don't walk into glass doors. Sometimes we do. 
But that's one takeaway: is it's not enough for not enough for an object to be transparent to be invisible. So what else do we need? Well, another early pioneer of invisibility in science fiction, of course, was H.G. Wells, and he was a trained biologist and probably had a lot of physics courses as well, and so he really knew a lot of what he was talking about. The image on the left actually is an original advertisement for the Invisible Man book from the 1890s. I found it on Google Books some time ago. And if you're not familiar with the story, it involves a fellow who figures out how to make himself permanently invisible, but figures out that that's actually not necessarily a good thing. Being unseen has its own disadvantages as well as advantages. We'll actually talk about a little bit of that later as well. But Wells had a little bit more sophisticated understanding of invisibility. When his character Kemp is explaining how his invisibility works, he talks about making a, a powdered glass. Powdered glass is very visible. But you can make it invisible by putting it into a liquid of very nearly the same refractive index. A transparent thing becomes invisible if it's put in any medium of almost the same index. And in his story, H.G. Wells argues that his character has his refractive index lowered from that of a human being to that of basically air, making him invisible. We can actually do this trick. It's actually a very simple thing to do at home. You can either buy these so-called water gems that people use to keep plants hydrated. Water gems are essentially 99% water, but they're still a solid, and you drop them into a glass of water and you can't see them. If you want to be a little bit more sophisticated, you can buy some Pyrex glass and buy some mineral oil, and by a happy coincidence, mineral oil and Pyrex have almost exactly the same refractive index, and the Pyrex seems to disappear when you dip it in the mineral oil. I should warn you that it's a little awkward because mineral oil is a laxative. If you go buy essentially a gallon or a quart of mineral oil at your local pharmacy, you might get some strange looks in the process. Well, for invisibility for our case, the challenge is, is that this still isn't really a good way to make an object invisible because for us, we'd like to have something that's invisible in air. And air has almost the same refractive index as vacuum and it's pretty much impossible to do an index matching to air. So that was sort of those early science fiction efforts had the right idea, but not really any sophistication to them. So let me continue with a little bit more history here, because this is my specialty, in fact. This was partly what I did my own PhD research on. And the story of invisibility in physics proper goes back to the early 1900s when researchers were trying to understand what goes into an atom. Now, of course, we back in those days, we barely even knew that atoms were real. There was still an argument about whether matter was a continuum or whether it was discrete little bits called atoms. By the early 1900s, we were pretty convinced that atoms existed, but we had almost no information about the structure of the atoms. And the only things we knew were that atoms had electrons in them. We knew that atoms somehow satisfied some strange laws of the periodic table, and the original periodic table is reproduced on the right. And we also knew that atoms emitted light in a very strange way, and the spectrum below is of Fraunhofer's depiction and sketch of the solar spectrum, and it was noted that atoms absorb and emit light with very discrete narrow spectral lines, which are the dark lines in the solar spectrum. So there was very little to go on, and people came up with a lot of ideas of how atoms were or how atoms were put together. And this is something you don't often see in history books or in science books. The central picture is of the plum pudding model by J.J. Thompson that came out in 1904, where he suggested the electrons, which were point particles, are sort of swirling around in a positive fluid of electrical charge. Now, not many people have heard of these other models. There's the dynamid model by Philip Linard, which suggested that electrons bound with some unspecified positive charge to form pairs that somehow bound together. The Saturnian model, which suggested that atoms 
the electrons sort of orbited the some sort of nucleus kind of like the rings of Saturn are sort of stable. There's the expanding electron theory of GA shock which is a bit strange and even hard to describe. And my favorite is the Archean model of Johannes Stark where he suggested that the positive charges are some sort of bar magnets that sort of line up kind of like you can make a ring of magnets in a circle. You could do that with, with positive charges to make atoms. But the biggest problem with all of these models is that they all really had to have moving electrons in them. And because the electrons are stuck in the atoms, that means the electrons are always accelerating. And even in the early 1900s, people realized that accelerating charges give off radiation. And so you see that, and we use this today, for instance, the picture here shows the advanced photon source at Argonne National Lab where a particle accelerator accelerates electrons to a very high speed and those electrons just by virtue of going in a circle end up giving off x-rays that can then be used for experiments. So people knew even in the early 1900s that electrons were accelerating in atoms and should be giving off radiation but they weren't. And why not? Well this is where the real story of invisibility in physics begins is Paul Ehrenfest, who became much more famous for other things, wrote a paper in 1910 and said that it was you could make accelerating extended distributions of electric charge that would not produce radiation. And the simplest one is shown here is imagine that you've got an infinite plane of electric charge, uniform, and that plane's just oscillating up and down. Well, without doing any math at all, by the symmetry of the problem, the electric field has to be pointing up and down or up or down in the picture. However, radiation, electromagnetic waves, the direction of propagation has to be perpendicular to both the electric and magnetic fields. However, because of the problem symmetry, both the electric and magnetic fields and any propagating electromagnetic waves would all have to be going in the upward or downward direction. And that's simply not possible, so this system can't radiate. We have accelerating charges and no radiation. You might say that that example is a little bit too simple because we never have an infinite, we never have an infinite amount of charge extended over a plane, but Ehrenfest pointed out that the same argument could be made for a pulsating charged sphere. So you can imagine we have a spherical balloon and we coat it uniformly with electric charge and then we just sort of inflate and deflate it periodically. But again, because of the symmetry of the system, the electric field, the magnetic field, and the direction of electromagnetic wave propagation all have to be radial. But they can't be because propagating electromagnetic waves, they have to have transverse fields. So this system also can't radiate. So Ehrenfest showed that, well, contrary to what people thought at the time, it is possible to have accelerating charges that don't produce radiation. However, his, his models came about at sort of a bad time, for him, not for physics, in that in 1910, Rutherford experimentally discovered the atomic nucleus the same year, and in 1913, Bohr developed his atomic model, and that started the beginning of the quantum theory of matter and light. And with the quantum theory, there really was no longer any need to have a, to have a non-radiating classical electric charge distribution. So the work by Ehrenfest was kind of forgotten for a while, but not completely. And these objects, these oscillating sources that don't produce radiation were eventually named non-radiating sources. And for the next probably 50 years, people struggled to find a reason to care about them. And it's kind of funny to see how the claims get more and more grandiose as you go through the years. Schott, G.A. Schott, who I mentioned earlier with one of the models of the atom, he suggested, well, maybe these non-radiating sources might be a model of the neutron. Well, then we figured out how the neutron worked, so Schott's model was out. Bohm and Weinstein suggested that the non-radiating source might explain a, the muon, and 
higher, heavier elementary particle. And well, then we kind of figured out the muon, so that was out. And then a fellow named Gadecki in 1964 just sort of went for broke and said, well, maybe these things will lead to a completely new theory of nature in which every sort of particle you can imagine can be described as a non-radiating charge current distribution. And there's even more papers than that. It's sort of fun to see how much people fought to find some sort of interesting reason to study these non-radiating sources. But the place where they really, where it really came back into importance was in a completely different field, and that field is the study of so-called inverse problems. You're probably all familiar with, at this point, the CT, or CAT scan machine, which was first invented in the 1970s. That's a photo of the very first commercial CT machine being used on patients. And this started this whole new field of study in which you could use electromagnetic waves or radiation to probe a person's internal structure without having to cut them open, beyond just a simple x-ray, that is. And an inverse problem, we should describe the term a little bit. The in, an inverse problem, there are many different inverse problems. Usually when you solve a physics problem, you solve a physics problem from a cause and effect direction. You say, okay, I've got this cause, now let me figure out what the effect is. For instance, if I shine light or radiation on an object, the cause would be the object structure and the effect would be the scattered field. The inverse problem is reversing that, saying, suppose we know the scattered field. Can I go back the other way and figure out what the object looks like? Can I figure out the cause given the effect? Well, CAT scans work really well, but it turns out a lot of inverse problems don't work very well. And the best way to explain this is to use a crime scene as an example of an inverse problem. It's not a scientific inverse problem or a physics inverse problem, but it actually illustrates the problems very well. That when you have a crime scene, you might want to look at the cause of a crime, say the murderer. You want to deduce the cause from the effect, which is a crime scene and the murder victim. Well, there are a number of reasons why that could be difficult. One of which is the problem maybe what we call ill-posed, and that is the information that you find at the crime scene may mistakenly lead you to the wrong conclusion. For instance, the murder victim may have had a drink with a friend, and that friend left his fingerprints on a glass and left town. He did nothing to do with the murder, but you find the glass and you assume he's guilty. So a little bit of in a wrong information may send you in the wrong direction. And this actually happens in inverse problems in physics. The other difficulty with inverse problems is the problem may simply be non-unique, and that is there may not be enough information present on the scene to solve the case at all. And this is exactly what can happen in imaging problems using radiation electromagnetic waves. And it can be shown that it's directly connected to the existence of invisible objects because if invisible objects exist, then any image that we create could potentially hide many hidden objects in them. I drew a little picture here showing that we might take an image of a person and it may hold a ghost or an invisible man in it. And that would be, of course, a very big problem, especially for medical imaging. There might be invisible tumors that we can't see with a particular imaging method, which would, of course, be very bad. Now, by the 1970s, these non-radiating sources were demonstrated to exist, at least in principle, but the analogous, pro the analogous objects for scattering problems, for light scattering and imaging problems, which were at the time known by the name non-scattering scatterers, it wasn't clear whether those existed or not. Fortunately, by the late 1980s, researchers had demonstrated that invisible objects seem to not exist, that you could always make an you could always design an object to be invisible when light is shining on it from a single direction for, or from a finite number of directions, but if you illuminate it from enough directions, you're eventually going to see some light scatter off of it, and you're going to detect that object. 
And that was good news for medical imaging systems and so forth that as long as you take enough data, you won't lose any information, there won't, you won't miss anything. So, in fact, this was about the time that I came into doing research and my PhD dissertation was on invisible objects and non-radiating sources and so it seemed to me that the problem was solved and no, I, I didn't look into it in too much detail whether invisible objects could exist. However, in 2006, I got a really big surprise along with a bunch of other people that two theoretical papers appeared in Science Magazine and both of them suggested that an object could be designed with a particular refractive index profile that guides light around a central cloaked region. And these two images are from the two competing papers that appeared back to back. Both images show the lines show the theoretical path of light rays coming in. The light rays would come in, they'd enter the cloak, they'd go around a central region where they which would be completely hidden, and then the light rays would be redirected on their way as if they had not encountered anything at all. So the object would be invisible and hide something within it. Well, even this takes us back to some science fiction, which I can't resist sharing. If you asked uh, Pendry and Lanhart and those folks back in 2006, this is a quote from them that the way that these cloaks work is to, it is possible to guide light around the cloaked region, the hole, like water flowing around a rock in a river so that the object inside it cannot be seen. So I've got my very crudely drawn rock in a river on the left and the cloak on the right. Similar analogy. What I find kind of fascinating is a fellow named Abe Merritt wrote a novel in 1931, 70 something years earlier, called The Face in the Abyss. And in The Face in the Abyss, he had these invisible creatures called the messengers. And his character in the novel says, yeah, you could imagine that the light rays stream over that something as water in a swift brook streams over a submerged boulder. So science fiction was to some extent ahead of the curve again in terms of understanding invisibility, albeit in a qualitative way and not a quantitative way. But back to cloaks. I had just finished telling you that people had concluded by the early 90s that invisibility was impossible. So why is there, why can we have cloaking papers and cloaking devices? Well, there are two ways of getting around this and each of the cloaking papers makes a very good point. In the paper by Leonhardt, he points out that, well, even if you can't make an object perfectly invisible, we don't really need it perfectly invisible. If it's 99% invisible, that's probably good enough. For instance, the Predator here in the movie Predator managed to kill off an elite special forces unit and he's by no means completely invisible. So apparently, mostly invisible is good enough in a lot of cases and there's nothing prohibiting something being mostly invisible. The more important or the more significant um, counter argument came from Pendry et al. and they pointed out that those early theoretical papers that argued about invisibility being impossible did not look at all possible materials. That is, the earlier proofs did not include materials that are what we call anisotropic. Anisotropic materials have, in essence, a light ray propagating through the crystal can be refracted one of two ways depending on which way the electric field is pointing. So as this picture shows, this is a picture of my own little piece of optical calcite, you end up with a double image of what's below the crystal because of these two paths that light takes through it. And the original, the original proof that said invisibility was impossible did not take into account these anisotropic materials. And so it turns out that invisibility is kind of possible, though we'll see there's still more limitations than these. Well, I was, uh, as a little personal note, I was actually interviewed about these original papers in 2006 just by virtue of my 
having worked in this area, and actually Ulf Leonhardt knew me by that point and just pointed people to talk to me. And every reporter asked me, well, when do you think that there'll be some sort of experimental demonstration of this cloaking device? And me, being a physicist who tries to be very cautious and conservative, said, well, you know, 20 years maybe before we see some experimental prototype. No, it turned out to be about three months later or so. Same year, 2006, uh, Pendry and his collaborators who did the theoretical work demonstrated experimentally that they could make a two-dimensional electromagnetic cloak that worked for microwave frequencies. And this is an illustration of the device they built. Obviously not invisible totally by any means, but they were trying to demonstrate that the principles of being able to guide waves around a central region could be done. And they did simulations and experiments, and this device incidentally is about 10 centimeters across, so not super big, but still very nice demonstration. And the, the upper two show simulation showing the light waves interacting with the cloak coming from the left, or the microwaves, interacting with the cloak and then traveling on. There's still some distortion. The effect isn't perfect, but it does seem to completely shield the interior region from the microwaves and send them along more or less the same way they were when they were when they hit the cloak. And the bottom two pictures showing the experiments, the bottom left just shows an aluminum cylinder which obstructs the microwaves. And the bottom right shows the cloak around this same aluminum cylinder where the obstruction is not so bad, that the microwaves get guided around the obstruction. So in fact Already there have been a number of prototypes, and we'll see a few more as we go on. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the mathematics and the theory that's used to design cloaks. These original cloaks use a method called transformation optics. And the idea of transformation optics is to imagine that when you look at an optical material, light, the path of light through a material is bent. Well, another way that the path of light could in principle be bent is by warping space itself. And this is what I show in this picture below. I drew a, a, ray, a red ray of light traveling diagonally through, let's say, ordinary space. The black dot represents a hole that you poke in the middle of ordinary space. And then you kind of stick your hands in and stretch out that, that poked hole and make a complete, complete spherical or circular gap. Now that circular region on the right in the middle, that, that is a place where there's no space at all. So that's been excluded. There, no light can travel there. But as we've distorted space around it, the light ray gets bent around that region and travels on as if nothing had happened. And that central region is the cloaked region where no light rays can in principle penetrate. Now the key of transformation optics is the observation that the equations that describe electromagnetic waves, if you, if you warp space in Maxwell's equations that describe electromagnetism, the same thing happens. It, it acts exactly as if you'd used a very special type of material without warping space at all. So what you can do with transformation optics is you can design a warping of space however you like. You can sort of stretch, mathematically stretch and distort space however, and then you can always find an analogous material that will have exactly the same effect. Now the trick is that material may be impossible to build by current technology or maybe ever, but in principle it can be done. In fact, you may note that this idea of warping space sounds a lot like general relativity, sort of gravity and warping of space and time. And in fact, the mathematics is almost identical. And others, people, other people have noticed this analogy. And in 2007, some theoreticians noted that you could create fake wormholes using these same special materials. You could design a, an optical hole in space where you could convey light from one side to another. And if you were to look in one of these electromagnetic wormholes, they did a simulation of what a checkerboard would look like. 
the left one is what it looks like through a short wormhole, and on the right, what it looks like if you look through a very long wormhole. So you have a warping of sort of the image as you look through this electromagnetic wormhole. I wanted to mention this because, in fact, just this year, a few researchers built one of these, though they built it for magnetic fields because magnet static magnetic fields are a lot easier to build or a lot easier to work with than electromagnetic waves. And what they really did is they demonstrated that you could make essentially a magnetic monopole using one of these sort of special material wormholes. And the way it makes a magnetic monopole is shown on the left. You can imagine taking a bar magnet. We know typically that if you like cut a bar magnet in half, you don't get a south pole and a north pole. You get another south-north pole bar magnet, another one on your other hand. But if you stick one end of a bar magnet into one of these magnetic wormholes, then all the magnetic fields of, say, the north pole get conveyed through the wormhole, and they pop out the other side, and they look like a magnetic monopole. And this is what these researchers did in an image of their, a schematic of their experimental device is shown on the right. They took a, and to look at it from the left to right, they took a ferromagnetic surface, that's the left sphere, a superconducting layer, that's the center, and another ferromagnetic sheet on the right side. They combined these together to design this wormhole. Well, this actually looked familiar to me, and it turns out the same researchers used the same technology in 2012 to make a, a cloak for magnetic fields. And it's a little easier to understand what they did from this picture. To make a cloak for magnetic fields, you take two pieces. You take a ferromagnet, like a piece of iron, and a piece of iron tends to draw in magnetic fields. It pulls magnetic fields inside it, just like the leftmost picture. Now, a superconductor tends to force magnetic fields out of it, as shown in the center picture. And if you put that superconductor inside that ferromagnet, and you've got their material properties and their thicknesses and so forth just right, you can have that sort of, you can have a balance between the repulsion of magnetic fields and the attractions and make a perfect magnetic cloak. So, we don't necessarily need to use these materials just for electromagnetic fields. We can also use them for magnetic fields and all sorts of other possible waves that we can encounter. Well, that's some of the good news. I should also mention some of the bad news, which is, for the most part, we still can't really make a lot of these things. And one of the biggest problems for visible light, the, the one that really gets people's imagination is making an invisibility cloak that works for visible light so that you can walk around the office and tap people on the shoulders and scare them without them seeing you. But visible light has a very short wavelength. And in order to make a cloak for visible light, we need to be able to construct a material not found in nature, which is anisotropic, and whose optical properties vary continuously within the structure. It would have to be done in three dimensions, and that structure would have to be built on the scale of a billionth of a meter. In the lower right corner, there's an image of a metamaterial that was built a number of years ago, and so you have to be able to have some sort of way of constructing this very complicated structure on a, where the structure is very small but reproduce it on a very large scale. And we can't really do that yet which is part of the reason why the people who did the original microwave experiment were working with microwaves. Microwaves are a, have a lot bigger wavelength. You can build these structures a lot easier. Another problem. Even very transparent materials are partially absorbing. Even a transparent material like glass. You take a very thick piece of glass, you're going to lose some light through the glass due to absorption. And so any type of cloaking device that you build that depends entirely on guiding light around the cloaked region is going to cast some sort of shadow. And that shadow is going to probably get bigger the bigger that you make the cloaking device. So there's a limitation there as well. But 
Perhaps one of the biggest limitations is that most of these devices designed so far only work for a very narrow range of wavelengths or very small range of colors. So we could kind of design a cloak that would hide you perfectly from a very specific shade of red, but probably not every other shade of red or blue or green light. And we can understand how, why that is just by looking at this picture here. Now, in order for the light wave to appear undisturbed after passing through the cloak, the light that the red line above that shows the light that traveled outside the cloak, any light that travels inside the cloak has to reach the end of this picture in the same amount of time. Otherwise, there'll be a phase shift in the light across the cross section of the cloak. Well, the path of light going in the cloak is much larger than the path of the light going outside the cloak. And so, in essence, light inside the cloak would in principle have to move faster than the vacuum speed of light in order for the cloak to be undetectable. And that's a really big fundamental limitation. People have shown that the bigger the cloak, the more narrow the number of wavelengths you can make things work for. And nobody's still really sure how to get around this. It's a really big fundamental limit of cloaking devices. So there have been a number of approaches that people have taken since these original cloaking devices came out. To, to try and reduce some of these limitations, people have invented new and what we could say are more limited types of cloaking devices, one of which has been given the nice name hiding under the carpet. Basically, the idea is, is instead of trying to hide an object in three dimensions from all directions, we imagine that we have an object that's on a surface, and we want to hide that object from anybody looking at it from above. We want, we want it to appear as if the surface is flat and there's no object there. Well, we can also use transformation optics to design such a cloak. A picture of how that's done is shown on the right. You imagine just taking ordinary rectangular space and you just sort of push up a gap underneath it, kind of like you'd make a little gap under a carpet. And that area would in principle be cloaked and the light rays that approach this cloaked region would appear to reflect off a flat surface and you wouldn't notice there's a bump there. This has actually been demonstrated on a surprisingly large scale. This, was a, this is an example of being careful about saying that something is impossible because every time you say something's impossible, pretty much somebody figures out how to do it like a week later. I think that's pretty much a rule in physics at this point. And the key here, I mentioned this optical calcite, this anisotropic material before. Well, it turns out you can make a perfectly serviceable, simple carpet cloak using optical calcite. And that's exactly what they did here, is they built, obviously you can see there are tweezers here, so it's not a very big one. Though as I understand it, this researcher has built them up to kind of a half a foot around type structure. But it demonstrates that this cloaking principle actually works, that when it's put there, you can't see the object underneath it, and you see right behind the object. Though you probably notice that the cloak itself is not invisible. You can see the cloak perfectly well. And also, if you were to look at this thing from any other direction, you would, you, it would not appear as a cloaking device at all. You would very clearly see that everything that was going on. So this particular device only works for limited directions of observation. Though, this is another piece of research that just came out literally this past week. The ultra-thin invisibility cloak, and this, this is another one that just hit all the newspapers and all the science sites. Researchers developed what they call a skin cloak. They developed a very thin cloth-like material. And on that material are a bunch of little antennas, almost kind of like the non-radiating sources we talked about earlier. And when you design these little antennas properly, you can design a cloak that you can just sort of drape over a rough object. And the light hitting that surface, it'll again, the light will reflect off that surface as if it is completely flat. Well. 
this is also still very limited. The news kind of overhypes things again because this device is still very wavelength dependent. It only works for a very narrow range of wavelengths. And it's also very object dependent. It depends that you have to design your skin cloak based on what you're trying to hide. So you can see from this picture this artist's interpretation that the skin cloak has very specific features etched on it which are tailored to hide the object underneath. So it, it's actually a very impressive scientific achievement, but it's not quite the invisibility Harry Potter cloak that the news media would like us to believe it is. Well, that's enough of a kind of a depressing part of the talk. Let's talk about some more fun possibilities, because if you stick to theoretical stuff, which is what I love to do, there are a lot of really crazy things you can do with these sort of cloaking ideas. One of which, and this came out in 2009, which was very surprising, is the observation that you don't need to have your invisibility cloak around the object you're trying to hide. This is what's called exterior cloaking. And the picture on the left shows what would happen if waves were hitting a particular object, a non-cloaked object, and the waves get distorted. And then they designed an exterior cloak. And this exterior cloak is not surrounding the object, but it's tailored to make that object invisible. And the combination of the object and the exterior cloak makes the, the combination completely invisible. So in principle, it's possible to make a cloak that would stand next to you and make you invisible as opposed to be around you. Perhaps my favorite possibility, though, that comes from cloaking and, and invisibility is what we could call illusion optics. Now, I mentioned before that the existence of invisible objects suggests that the inverse scattering problem is not unique. And I mention that for a reason, because if the inverse scattering problem is non-unique, that means that when I scatter light off of an object, I may see the object, I may get a realistic picture of what that object looks like, or I may see something completely unidentifiable, or it may look like something else completely. So it's in principle possible to design an invisibility cloak that makes one object look like another. So here I designed a, I drew a picture showing that we could design a cloak that would make an apple look like an orange. Or if we go back to the very beginning of the talk, there was a headline about making tanks look like cows. That's what illusion optics is. It's making one object look like another. And this has been demonstrated theoretically again. Here's some simulations from pap a paper in 2009 where they took a spoon and they made an exterior illusion cloak that made the spoon look like a cup. And the waves that are, the scattered waves from the illusion look, in the center picture, look very much the same as the scattered waves off of an exact cup. So there's this idea that once we allow for these anisotropic special materials, we completely break the normal relationship that tells us that the information we get when light scatters off of an object is, is worthwhile. But we can go even crazier. If you, since we can create illusions or cloaks that are exterior to the object in question, we can make an illusion that makes a hole look like, looks, make, sorry, makes a wall look like it has a hole in it. So on the left, we've got a, an electromagnetic source behind a wall. No waves get through. In the center picture, we put an illusion object on the other side of the wall. And that illusion object basically creates an illusion of a hole in a wall. And now waves pass through exactly as if there was an actual hole in the wall. Well, there are two catches here again. You don't have to worry about anybody kind of spying through your walls yet because in these simulations that hole in a wall is on the order of a, or that wall thickness is on the order of a few wavelengths or a few million, fract, million fractions of a meter. And also, this depends again, just like invisibility cloaks, it depends strongly on 
specific wavelengths being activated and being used. And so also not necessarily an object that's directly practical, but it really shows you that strange things are possible. You can also flip this around. You can make a virtual where you can make a virtual hole in a wall. You can make a virtual wall in a hole. You can create a you can put a hole in a wall and put an object in it that has the illusion of looking bigger than it is, so that it blocks light from coming out as if there were an actual wall in the way. And this was this is an object dubbed a super scatterer by the authors who discussed this in 2009. Again works for specific wavelengths, for not very thick walls, so concealing a secret door this way is still a bit outside of our reach, but that's what you got. And I already mentioned magnetic fields, that we can cloak magnetic from magnetic fields and other types of waves, and one of the other interesting things is people show that you can kind of cloak from thermal heat. You can actually design a cloak using the same transformation optics techniques that shields an interior region from heat for a certain amount of time. You can never you can never permanently shield a region from heat, but you can design a cloak that makes the heat want to go around the object more than inside of it. And so you can create a sort of thermal cloak this way. And now we get into some really out there sort of ideas. In 2012 it was proposed that we could actually design a cloak that would protect offshore rigs or offshore buoys from damaging water waves. And this works by a slightly different technique. What happens is is in a lot of in a lot of ocean environments you have what are called you have internal waves underneath the surface that there's a there's a sharp boundary of density between the upper part of the water and the low end, say the deeper water. And waves can travel along that boundary with a different wavelength. So the idea is, is to create some sort of surface roughness on the bottom of the sea, which hopefully your surface waves will somehow feel through the water. And those that those bottom ripples will couple the surface waves into these underwater waves and then couple them back on the other side so that our we create in essence an underpass for damaging waves it will go underneath the object this paper was published i have no idea how practical or plausible it is but again it's a really cool idea another really cool idea is cloaking from earthquakes and and again when if we've got a wave we can use pretty much the same sort of techniques that we use for light and so we can in principle imagine designing sub structures that go under the ground that would surround a building and under the ground and then when an earthquake wave comes in the waves get guided around the building and sent along their way without hurting the building Though, as I show in the bottom picture, this does raise some interesting questions. If you're if you're building as a cloak for earthquakes and the building behind doesn't, you might be facing a lawsuit or at least feel some guilt out of the out of the deal. And this has actually been sort of roughly tested. I, I thought this was completely crazy idea, but in 2003, published in or 2013, and published in 2014. Researchers in France actually tested this out. They used a they used a source, they had a subsurface source that you can see in the pic, upper picture on the left, and then they drilled boreholes five meters deep in the ground, and they designed those holes to act as a barrier to seismic waves. And the picture on the lower right, you can actually, and then they had sensors behind those holes. And the picture on the lower right, you can see the results where they show the intensity of the seismic waves as a function of position and the hot the hot red region which is actually where the vibrations are strongest is constrained to the area around the source the waves were not effectively able to penetrate this barrier so there are possibilities there again if this becomes an application it's a long way off but the past three examples show something that I've been 
starting to harp on people about is that actual invisibility may not be the most useful application of cloaking technology. It may be much more useful for these sort of protection applications, designing, designing structures that can protect an object from some sort of damaging way. And the nice thing about protection is protection never has to be perfect. If we could, in fact, design a seismic cloak that could reduce the intensity of an earthquake around a building by a factor of 10, it might still be a very bad earthquake, but it might allow our buildings to be that much more resistant to, uh, to a seismic wave. Will it happen? Nobody seems to know right now, and it's unclear how much more work people are doing on it at the moment. So this is sort of the, a big rundown on what the cool ideas are and some of the basics behind invisibility in science. And there's a really long history, and I only touched on some of the high points. There are a bunch of other things I could say about science and invisibility, but I'll, I'll keep this from going over for too long. And though the one thing I like to note, those early, those early science fiction stories that I mentioned that talked about invisibility, I like to say that the actual science of invisibility has gotten even weirder than the science fiction. The idea of these illusion cloaks, of external cloaking, of creating optical wormholes, these are things that the science fiction writers that were writing about invisibility, they didn't quite reach that level. So finally science has caught up or even gotten ahead of the curve. And the big picture of the field is most of the ideas are still theoretical and there are serious theoretical and technical challenges remaining. And it'll depend, we'll see what happens in the next few years. I hate to rule anything out because I've looked foolish a number of times already in saying things were impossible. Who knows what'll happen. And so if I draw a little gauge, invisibility used to be in the red zone of impossible forever. It moved into the possible in 2006 with the original cloaking papers. And right now, people are fighting to push it into the plausible region where we could say, yeah, this could actually work in a very practical way. And we'll see what happens. Let me conclude by showing you there's a very fun way to make your own very crude, very cheap cloak at home. If you take eight optical prisms and you put them together as shown on the right, they'll actually create a very crude cloaking illusion. The light coming from behind the object will be bounced around the central region. And then if you put your finger inside the cloak, like there, you don't see it. You put your finger outside or behind it and you see it and you see everything behind. So it's something you can actually try at home. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Greg. All right, let me unmute everyone. Whoop, what's that? Everyone is unmuted. So I'd like to thank you. This is fantastic. Do we have any questions from local audience or from our guests there at Suffolk? <laughs> Is anyone still awake? <laughs> Charlie, I know we've got questions. What do you guys got? I have a question. All right, Harrison, go for it. So before you started talking, I was thinking about like those stealth planes that you got a lot of military contracts related to. I was thinking about stealth planes. And um, whenever you talk about the hiding in the park, was that maybe? Uh, one of the technologies they thought about for like a flat surface where there's nothing but sky behind it. Oh, for stealth technology you're asking about? Yeah. Or if you know what how it works, would you mind? Yeah. Um, stealth is interesting because it's definitely sort of a different sort of cloaking. And there's a couple of pieces. There's an interesting connection to modern cloaking. Now, there are sort of two pieces that go. I, I kind of say there are two pieces that go into a stealth plane. One of which is you notice how all the surfaces are flat on a stealth plane. 
right. which makes it a nightmare to fly. But the reason for that is when people shoot, when people hit a, a plane with radar, radar really depends on some of the radar waves being reflected directly back to the detector. Now, if you have a flat surface, what happens is those radar waves get reflected off the flat surface, and they usually, and almost none of them, actually bounce directly back. You can kind of imagine if there's a curved surface, then no matter what direction you hit that curved surface with light, some of it's going to shoot right back. But with a flat surface, you have to hit it directly right on the flat surface for the wave to go right back the other way. And that's one piece of stealth. Sorry? Oh, I was just saying, okay, that's uh, <laughs> Yeah, the, the other piece of stealth technology, which is much more classified, is there's a lot of, of radar-absorbing paint involved that sort of sucks in the energy and minimizes the reflection. And one of the interesting connections to modern cloaking is, well, first of all, well, let's see, where's a good place to tell this story? I didn't prepare this story, so let me see. <laughs> uh, John Pendry, who is one of the original authors of the cloaking stuff, um, he's also the father of what we call metamaterials, sort of unnatural materials that you have to design by manipulating the structure of matter on a small scale. Well, Pendry got involved with metamaterials because he was working with uh, the Navy, I assume the British Navy, th since he's from the UK. And the Navy had, were, the Navy was working on designing a paint that, for ships that would not reflect radar. And the Navy discovered this paint that worked really well, and they had no idea why. And they brought Pendry in, and Pendry said, oh, and he looked at it, he studied it, and he sort of came up with a theory and said, well, it's because you've made this thing with this really weird internal structure that, that sort of allows the radar waves to go in and doesn't allow them to come back out. And so that sort of spurred the, so that sort of military design of stealth paint and technology sort of led in part to the next generation of cloaks and so forth. That's my long way of explanation. <laughs> All right, other questions? You're lovely. Hi. All right, say it loud. Um, so if when you were talking about mathematically, you have to uh, bend space so, so that uh, the light passes around it. Um, I, just with my connections and knowing an African astrophysics class over this uh, summer, it sounds an awful lot like an inverse black hole almost in that, you know, it bends, you know, the space around it and the heavy gravity, and so it's just like, you know, it's kind of a question there, but you know, <laughs> it's explicitly state. I, I, I could actually run with that. Uh, actually, the, yeah, the math is pretty much, the math, as I said, is pretty much analogous to what's used in general relativity, and people have, in fact, used it to design optical black holes. So you make a material that works very much like a black hole, that if anything, if any light passes too close to the interior, it sort of gets sucked into the middle. And again, people aren't really sure what to do with that yet, but um, it is something that people have done. Something else people have done is they've taken the analogy further. A true black hole not only warps space, it warps time. And one of the ways that I've seen it described is it can be described kind of like oh, a, a waterfall. waterfall. That yeah. as you get closer to the edge of the waterfall, the water's flowing faster and faster in. And so there's a critical point near the edge of the waterfall while the water's moving too fast to throw yourself back out and you're doomed to fall in. Well, people have also created that sort of system optically. They've used optical pulses and designed it so that an optical pulse so they basically, they didn't design a black hole, they designed a white hole using laser pulses and fibers. And it's really cool stuff, and I should share, I wrote a blog post about it, and can share a link on that too, it's really neat. So yeah, there's a lot of analogies. Cool. So Greg, where would uh, interested undergraduates go to learn more at the graduate level from 
or this kind of stuff? Where, where are the, the institutions, uh, either in the U.S. or elsewhere, that is doing this kind of work? Uh, that's a good question. Well, I can always I can always tout myself and my department. We have myself is doing theoretical stuff on invisibility. Uh, there's also a colleague in my department who's doing research on optical metamaterials and invisibility. Um, there's also Duke University is very some of the original work on the invisible cloaks from 2006 were done by researchers at Duke that I mentioned. Um, I believe Pendry's at I believe Imperial College, um, but there's also I want to say UCLA or California somewhere in California. Some of the groups whose work I described here, that's where it's being done, where these devices are being built. But most departments now that do optical research have some sort of some sort of group working on metamaterials. It's been a very hot topic in optics because the sky's the limit to some extent. There's all these things that ought to be impossible previously. That now that we have this sort of freedom to control the optical properties of matter, at least in principle, we can break all sorts of rules. So lots of people and lots of research groups are very interested in this sort of stuff. Okay. Do we have any questions from our guests? <laughs> so as yeah. uh, yeah. so the, the big thing is trying to get the light uh, around the objects and using different materials to push it outward. But what about certain gases to slow uh, the light down that's outside the object that's being cloaked? You know, in principle, you might think about doing something like that. Um, of course, the catch is, is that it might get very suspicious to have an invisible object if there's this like, cloud of high refractive index gas around it. But uh, the other way to think about it as well is that people have looked at this sort of stuff for cloaking in water. You don't have the same limitations in water as you do in air because you do have that water, light is traveling slower than the vacuum speed of light, so you can get away with, you can, you can do the cloaking stuff a lot easier there. But I haven't seen specifically any attempts to use a particular gas, but in a sense, that's sort of a that is sort of a possibility. Is one of the one of the ways you can try and do it is simply try and increase the refractive index around the cloak. Okay. That's what I have to say about that. Okay. <laughs> well, great. What advice might you have for uh, undergrads? You know, uh, looking at these young folks here, what sort of things might you encourage undergrads to? Uh, do that you've learned yourself over the course of your career uh, and what you're currently working in. What, what sort of hints or pro tips might you give current undergrads? Okay, for undergrads, in, for in, in general, right? Well, physics in particular, but yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, a couple of things that I learned. One thing that I learned is that there's a difference between the physics that intrigues you and the physics that you enjoy doing. Mm. And there's, it's often good to make sure that you look at both of those. When I, when I was an undergraduate, I started an experimental particle physics. And because I was really interested in solving big picture fundamental physics problems. And then I, I discovered along the way as I went into graduate school that I was actually I really liked doing I really liked doing theoretical stuff and I didn't really like doing the experimental stuff that I was doing. And so I kind of fell in love with the theory stuff which I had not really explored before. And so one thing I would say is to sort of explore a bit about what sort of work was out there and not just what you find interesting now, but what, how that work is done. And one of the usual things to say is to get involved in some sort of research as soon as you can if you're planning to go on into graduate school. Um, getting some sort of research background is always useful. And I guess something else I could say is don't sell yourself short. I had horrible low self-esteem as an undergraduate going into graduate school. And I think I 
stayed away from theory for a long time and slowed down my career because I was trying to convince myself that I couldn't do it. And I actually had this sort of impression, I was like, you know, when I start reading a scientific paper, I fall asleep. I'm not sure I could actually do this for a living. And, and so I had to convince myself to, hey, I can do this, this is what I really want to do, and to not sell, my, not sell myself short. Yeah, I think it's something that we all struggle with when you you see people who are successful and you don't see all the work that went into becoming successful and you yourself are then feeling, oh man, I'll never get to that point. Yep. Yeah. But it's just hard work. Yep. yep. Any other questions locally? Then we're going to ask our uh, guests if they have questions. No? All right, yes, do we have any uh, questions? No questions? Well, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Greg, well, one last question. Do uh, your, does your institution there have any REU uh, programs that students could come work with you for a summer to learn more about uh, optics? You know, I believe I believe we do, but strangely, I, ha I don't know that much about it right now. <laughs> if anybody wants to, to get in touch with me or uh, and follow up with me, I can look into it in more detail. Okay. All right. We will do it. Definitely do that. I'll shoot you an email when we get done. Well, let's thank our speaker one more time. This has been great. Thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to give us this awesome seminar. Uh, it was fantastic. Really enjoyed the historical background and leading up to the, the technical difficulties. So it really is a, it's a real good teaser because you're like, man, I want to go. I'm going to learn more. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Greg. We're going to stop the broadcast. All right. Thank All right. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.